Thank you for joining us on the 19th edition of the Virtual Throws Conference. We're excited to have Coach Chris Mack with us today. We tried a different format for this one, being around the holidays, so we pre-recorded this. Let us know how you like this format. Um, and before we get going, a quick thanks to the National Throws Coaches Association and MF Athletic, who are both big supporters of the show. So our guest today is Coach Chris Mack. He is a combined events coach with USA Track and Field, working out of the Chula Vista Olympic Training Site. Um, he's got a group of heptathletes and decathletes doing some great things there. We're excited to talk with him a little bit about the throws and, and combined events training. So we'll get to it. Thanks for watching. All right, so we are recording. Uh, thanks, Coach Mack, for joining us. And um, for those of you that don't know, Coach Mack is the uh, Maltese and pole vault coach at the, uh, is it still the Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista? I, I think you guys had a name change, but um, Olympic Training Site, maybe? Yeah, uh, it's the Chula Vista like, Elite Athlete Training Center, but it is considered an Olympic Training Site. Uh, it's not a center anymore like it is in Colorado Springs, but still has the same purpose <laughs> well thanks for thanks for joining us coach we're excited to kind of uh pivot a little bit from our normal strictly throws curriculum here and you know i guess still talk about the throws but talk about it from a little bit of a different perspective and um i'm excited because i coach you know i coach at williams college and i coach um throws pole vault and work with our multi some as well so it's a little bit uh, selfishly in my wheelhouse. I'm excited, excited to talk with you, you know, more about it and, um, would love to just hear a little bit about your coaching journey and, you know, um, how you've gotten to where you are and, and where you came from as an athlete and as a, as a younger coach. And I'll let you take the, take, take it from there. Sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate you, you having me and, uh, just, uh, thanks for the opportunity, I guess, to share my story a little bit. Um, so yeah, I was, uh, primarily a pole vaulter when I was an athlete. Um, I grew up in Sacramento. I went to Jesuit high school uh, there. And then I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo um, for undergraduate. And that's where um, I walked on uh, to the team. I was only a 14, six pole vaulter in high school. Um, I walked on and luckily they gave me an opportunity. Um, and I was, uh, I made the team and luckily I got to spend five great years there and I uh, was able to go from 14-6 up to 17-6 before uh, I got injured. And, but that injury is actually what kind of got me into coaching. Um, while I was an athlete, uh, my, my girlfriend who eventually became my wife, she was also a uh, pole vaulter and ended up becoming an NCAA champion. Um, we used to go up to Jan Johnson's house at Sky Jumpers, and we would, uh, and it was the first opportunity where someone told me, if you want to get better at the sport yourself, you need to learn how to teach it to somebody else. And so right away where I thought I was going there to learn how to become a better pole vaulter, I was already coaching and teaching, uh, these campers and high schoolers and stuff like that. And so I thought that was a a really good uh, lesson and I've pretty much applied that anywhere I've coached whether it was in college or professional I always try to get them to coach somebody because when you start to coach somebody you start to see the little cues and things that you're like oh that's what I do wrong <laughs> maybe I should work on that myself <laughs> but anyway so um, so I got to that's kind of where my coaching began was uh, at sky jumpers um, pole vault camps um, I then went to Indiana University for graduate work where I got my master's in sport biomechanics because originally I thought um, I wanted to be a sport biomechanist and work for USA track and field in that in that sense. Um, I had met Peter McGinnis at the 2000 and 2004 Olympic trials because um, he was the sport biomechanist for the pole vault and at the Reno pole vault summit and so he uh, kind of allowed me and took me under his wing and, and said, Hey, here's some of the, you know, good programs you could apply to. So when I went to Indiana, I actually got to study. Uh, my advisor was Jesus de Pena, um, who basically is the sport biomechanist for USA high jumping, uh, at the time he's retired now, but, um, so I got, I got a lot of great information and I actually was able to get a six year of eligibility, uh, cause of my injuries at Cal Poly and I did pole vault 
uh, for IU for one year. Um, so that was, that was, that was pretty fun. Um, but it also allowed me to be a graduate assistant coach there. So I helped um, coach the, the pole vaulters while I was doing my graduate work uh, at Indiana. Uh, as soon as I was done with that, I started realizing like uh, I wasn't really into being in the lab all the time digitizing data. So <laughs> I, uh, I was like, okay, I, I know I, I, I'm always dreaming about just being up on the out on the track. So I was, I was definitely a, uh, a, a qualitative biomechanist, not a quantitative. I, I wanted to just be out there seeing it and, and observing and making changes that way. Um, but obviously the, all the schoolwork and, and stuff that I did to get my master's, uh, I feel has helped uh, with regards to being able to apply it to more than just the events that I did. Um, I then had the opportunity when I was kind of figuring out uh, how do I get into coaching. Um, my wife then, because she moved out and we got married, uh, she was coaching gymnastics at Bloomington High School North, and she was able to get me a coaching uh, gig for the high school there in Bloomington, um, at Bloomington North High School, And uh, but it was for throws. <laughs> so my technical first paid <laughs> coaching position, I was a throws coach. <laughs> Perfect, you fit uh, right in here, it's great. <laughs> Well, but they also then let me help out with uh, the pole vaulters since they knew that was kind of my thing. Um, was I a good throws coach at first? No, <laughs> I don't think so. I think, I think what I did was I got the athletes super pumped and I got them super fit. And I think they threw further just because they were in better shape. <laughs> I don't think it was any technical thing at the in the beginning that I really uh, um, taught them, but. You know, I had, uh, had a young man, um, I don't know, I'm sure I remember his last name, but his name was Gabe. And, um, but he ended up improving from like, I, I want to say like 50 feet in the shot to close to 60 feet in the shot. So it was, it was pretty good. And, but again, I didn't know anything about the spin at that time. So I was just like, I don't know, let's watch some videos, dude. <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, and then um, I had a, a young lady, Lara Luby, in the, in the discus who ended up getting third in the state. So um, it was, it was kind of fun just to branch out. Um, and it was also the first year that Indiana had girls pole vault um, in their state meet. And so uh, I got to work with a young lady uh, that finished second in that. So that was, that was really kind of cool. Um, but then I guess I got the, the fun struggle that most people do. I was like, well, I want to coach. How do you do that? What's the process? And so I worked, man, I worked so many different jobs while I was applying all over the, I mean, I applied for everything. I applied D3, D2, D1, JUCO. Uh, and I didn't get, I didn't get any return calls at all for over probably a year and a half. Um, so I just kept, I worked in facilities for Indiana, um, just doing like daily reports. I worked for a, a land surveying company <laughs> and I would go out and work the rods and the, and the gun with people surveying like uh, John Mellencamp's uh, properties out there. That was, I had to go find the property lines out in the Hoosier National Forest. <laughs> so um, but a lot of, you know, cool experiences as, as you're trying to get into coaching. Uh, eventually, uh, my wife and I figured like there wasn't a lot out in the Midwest for us. So we moved back to California. Um, and I started working physical therapy just because that was kind of the other um, profession, I guess, that I thought I would go into if I couldn't get into coaching. Um, and so we were living in... Um, Thousand Oaks kind of area, Westlake Village, and uh, my wife was teaching gymnastics still, and and I was uh, working in physical therapy, and and I was applying, still applying for jobs and not getting any <laughs> any hits at all, uh, and then eventually I was like, well, I, I guess I'll go get my doctorate in physical therapy, and um, and uh, so I applied to a bunch of different programs and that, uh, and then as as the acceptances to those different programs came in, I was like, okay, like talked with my wife and I was like, okay, like I should really probably just apply for one last track job because I, I need to probably like move on. <laughs> you know, it, it was really like, okay, if God really wants me to be a track coach, I, I guess this is it because I'm only gonna apply for one last job. And so we go on to the NCAA job market and the only job on there was Stanford University so I just started laughing. I was like, okay, I was supposed to be a physical therapist. <laughs> so 
Uh, but I filled out the application and I sent it in and literally, I don't know, it felt like forever because I forgot about it. I just kept going to work. Um, I had told all the people I work with, I was like, okay, well, I applied for this one last one, but yeah, right. <laughs> um, so eventually I got my acceptance letters to PT school and I remember this day very clearly. I, I decided we were going to actually move back to the Midwest because I got into the DPT program at Ohio State. And so I was like, okay, this is where we're gonna go because my parents live there right now and I could get in-state tuition and, and it was a little bit easier route. Um, so as I'm walking out with the letter to go, like turn it into the mail to say, I'm going, the phone rings. And I remember specifically putting that packet down on the coffee table by the front door, go over and pick up the phone. I'm like, hello. And on the other line, it's like, is this Chris Mack? And I'm like, yes and like this is edric floreal with stanford track and field and it sounded like one of the people that i work with and so my first comment was like Haha, yeah you're i don't know if i can curse on this show but you're s'ing me <laughs> and uh and edric's like mm, nope this is edric with stanford university i was like oh god i'm so sorry <laughs> And that was how our relationship started with me. <laughs> what an icebreaker. Right? Uh, so yeah, so I had three phone interviews, uh, one in-person interview, and then I was hired and I started at Stanford on January 1st of 2004. <laughs> nice. That's so cool. I think uh, a lot of it was my honesty with them because they were hiring for combined events and uh, vertical jumps. And they're like, you know, how are you going to coach the multis? And I was like, well, uh, these are the events that I know. These are the events that I don't really know, but I know that I learn quickly and you have some of the most amazing staff. So I'm going to learn from there. I will learn from you. I will learn from Robert Weir. I will learn from uh, Andy Gerard. I'll learn from Dina Evans. And I'm going to just be a sponge. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so I started and I, I got to work um, six, seven seasons at Stanford, nice. uh, which was fantastic. Um, just coaching the multis, um, coaching the vertical jumps, and then even uh, for one and a half seasons, I coached the javelin just because the new throws coach uh, didn't really know the javelin. And since I was coaching the multis anyway, so um, I coached the javelin that year. Um, but yeah, it was funny. I, I guess quick little story on that. First day of work, I walk in and uh, I go I go to the office. I'm like, hey, Edric, how's it going? I'm, I'm, I can't wait to start. And he's like, ah, oh, cool, welcome. He's like, hey, by the way, what's what's your cell phone number? I was like, I don't have a cell phone. <laughs> he's like, great, don't come back till you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot, yeah. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, so, um, I really enjoyed my time at Stanford, um, but eventually it's the Bay Area. We went from having no kids to one kid to two kids in a small one bedroom. And eventually we're like, I don't know if this is going to work out anymore. Yeah. Um, and luckily I had met a lot of coaches over the years, uh, whether it was at the convention and stuff like that. And at the same time, um, kind of like before, uh, we were struggling. Uh, Paul and I, my wife, were just praying about it. And the next day I got a phone call. And it was, it was Susan at uh, University of Cincinnati. And I was like, well, we prayed, a phone call came just like last time. And so we'll go with that. <laughs> and yeah. so we moved, uh, we moved to Cincinnati and, uh, and I got to work there for six years. And I guess one of the things that was tempting about it was they said it was possible that over after like two or three years that, you know, Bill Schneer might retire and I could have a chance to be a head coach. And, and that's actually what happened. So, um, but there it was, it was, uh, I didn't coach the multi events when I was there. I just coached the jumps and then, um, uh, but I would help out uh, Chris Weinberg um, who was the multi events coach. Cause he was a great decathlete for Cincinnati back then. So, um, I would just help coach the pole vault or anything else that he wanted help with. And, um, but it was, it was good. And then kind of, you know, six years down the road, um, I think it was more of an interesting time, uh, of how I got to the, to the training center, because a lot of things were just going on in our lives. Uh, my wife got cancer. Um, 
I was still trying to struggle with like, how do I, I always wanted to be on a, an international uh, USATF team, like on staff. And I didn't really know what I was doing wrong. I was always applying, but never got really uh, accepted to those things. Uh, sounded familiar. <laughs> um, and then eventually, like I talked with Terry Crawford, who was my head coach at Cal Poly at the time, but then she was in charge of USA coaching. Um, she said, you just need to do more with USATF. Um, Jeremy Fisher was already a good friend. Every time we went to San Diego to see my wife's family, I'd always go down and see him at the center. He'd always, you know, joke around, hey, you want to come work here one day with me? I'm like, yeah, dude, why not? <laughs> why wouldn't I? <laughs> so, um, but it was, it was interesting because kind of the same thing. I was driving out to Illinois for a recruiting visit and I had passed through Indianapolis and I got a call and it was Duffy Mahoney with USATF High Performance. And he was like, hey, uh, this is Duffy. I was just wondering if uh, maybe tomorrow we could uh, do a little interview for our open position out in Chula Vista. I was like, are you serious? I was like, I actually just drove through Indianapolis and I'm going to be coming back through later tonight. Is there any way we could do it tonight? And he was like, <laughs> Oh yeah, no problem. When he gave me a time in a restaurant to meet him at 20 minutes later, I ran over a bolt and blew out my tire. Uh -oh. <laughs> I was like, Whoa, maybe this isn't meant to be. Um, anyways, long story short, I met some of the most amazing people in the back roads of Illinois that basically helped me change the tire. Cause I was in a full suit for a recruiting visit. I still made it to my home visit which went really well because she still ended up going to Cincinnati, thank goodness. Um, and then I made it back just in time for the interview, had a wonderful dinner and a talk with, with Duffy. And at the end of the two hours, he's like, so how do you want to do this? I was like, how do I want to do what? <laughs> we'd, we'd like to hire you. I was like, oh, well, I need to talk to my wife first. He's like, good idea. <laughs> So, always a good idea but at, but at the time it was it was it was perfect just because obviously my wife is from san diego and and we didn't really have anybody out in the midwest so i think when you're, you're going through cancer and radiation treatment and you're thinking about all those kinds of things it, it all you know god has god has his timing and it just all lined up and so um even though i was only in like second year of being a head coach and i really liked that and i loved you know guiding a team uh, this was a great opportunity for me to uh, challenge the other thing that I'd always wanted to do. And that was, you know, I think every coach wants to know, like, okay, most people know, like, okay, well, I know I can take a high schooler and turn them into a high school American or something like that. And then it's like, okay, and then you're in college or JUCO. And it's like, well, I can recruit those kids. And can I turn those kids into an NCAA All-American? And so then the next step in your brain kind of becomes, well, can I turn those top NCAA All-Americans into... USA national team members and then once you do that it's can I coach a medalist and, and stuff like that and so it's really kind of uh, I guess the journey that um, I've always been on I, I think being a perfectionist doesn't help because <laughs> you're always wanting to know what can I do better what can I do better what can I do better um, I was gonna say, it's almost like us coaches are competitive too you know I mean <laughs> right exactly and so it's it's been a journey. Uh, it's been a fun. I'm, I've already been, I can't believe I'm like literally at the end of this next year, I will have been at the center longer than I've been at any of those other schools all of, over seven years. And I usually at the end of six, I think was when I was done with the other two, not on purpose. I would have loved to have stayed, but you know, circumstances always kind of came up, but that was a very long story of my journey. No, that's <laughs> And so now you're coaching multis um, and you have some pole vaulters too? Uh, so this year I don't have any pole vaulters, but I, I have had pole vaulters at the center. Um, so currently I coach HEPs, DEX, uh, and I do coach some uh, Paralympic uh, sprinter jumpers uh, as well. Um, but yeah, at one point I did, I think in 2017, and this is probably... <laughs> Uh, it was a little bit too much. I had 11 pole vaulters at the center. And, uh, and uh, sometimes you find out that um, you find your limit on the amount of, uh, I want to say, elite personalities that you can handle at one time. <laughs> I, you know, because I was thinking like back in Cincinnati, I think my jumps group was 
35 strong. I was like, oh, I'm only going to have 15 athletes, you know, between the four multis and the limp poles. I got this. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole new world when, when uh, the, the stress levels are high and you're trying to get people into meets and they got to reach standards. And uh, especially for me, I, I had already, I was bringing in pole vaulters that were already Olympians or world team members. So really it was like, you know, they were already at such a high level and it was like, they were coming to you to get to that next step of metal attainment and stuff like that. And so, um, so you could see that it was a big demand of, of your time. And I don't think I really realized, you know, the demand of time for that many pole vaulters and then just the natural demand of time for a combined event athlete because that takes up a lot of all day training <laughs> so uh i think i bit off a little bit more than i could chew um but i think that's okay i mean i learned from it um unfortunately i don't have any vaulters at the at the center right now um maybe it's because i, I took on too many that one year but hopefully at some point they'll come back <laughs> yeah no and i was wondering earlier it's like how do you like find the athletes that you work with at a, you know at a place like the chula vista is it through the usa track and field kind of or people reaching out to you or like how do you come to work with you know different people sure so i i technically i work for usa track and field and it's called the usatf residence program and so to be in the residence program which have both on-site and off-site uh spaces um college athletes who have obtained the A standard, um, which is very hard to do. There's not, there's not too many of them out there. Um, you know, they have the opportunity to um, apply uh, for, this, for this program and they've got to get letters of recommendation. They got to fill out the, you know, pretty long um, application. Um, now there are some that I recommend to USATF that don't have that A standard. And I, you know, basically recommend them saying, I believe that give me, you know, one or two years, I can get this person to the level that they will be making teams and then hopefully onto the to metal attainment since that's really kind of, I guess, what, what our business is, <laughs> is, is metal attainment. Um, so those are, those are the kids. So there's really not that many out there, especially in the, in the combined events. Um, Cause right now that's 8350 in the deck, that's 6420 in the HEP. Um, you really don't get too many of, of those uh, coming out of college. Yeah. Um, but usually they're, they're pretty good about like, if I'm like, hey, look at this person, you know, they scored, you know, 8,100 or, hey, look, they've scored in the high 6,000 or 6,100. You know, I think that these people can end up being what we're looking for. Um, then they'll, they give them a two year chance basically to come and, and train and prove themselves. And if they do do that, then they can continue with, with the program. That's cool. And when you're, when you're recommending those people, you like, I mean, I'm sure you have a bunch of different reasons for recommending, but is it like this person reached 7,100, but I can see kind of a, a hole here or, you know, just talking to the coaches or. Um, I mean, a lot of them, I, it, it's kind of a little bit like college recruiting. You know, I go to the NC2As, I watch how they compete. I watch how they interact with their, their coaches. Uh, most of their coaches I already know, cause we were, you know, uh, battling it out, um, when I was in the NC2A. Uh, so we're, we're pretty good friends as it is. Um, so a lot of times I can kind of just, um, talk to their coaches. Um, some of it is even just listening to their current training that they get and then seeing whether or not the way that I like to train people uh, maybe would complement, or maybe they're not getting some of the stuff that I like to do. Um, and maybe that's what could possibly make them better. Um, and that could be, you know, from, uh, you know, someone that maybe doesn't do a ton of volume of running and maybe I like to do volume of, of running work to, to get someone, maybe it's, or even in the, in the throws, you know, making sure that we're throwing from day one, uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be the implement, but we're doing it from day one and we're hitting all the throws, um, during each week. 
you know, just certain things like that. Um, Cause for the most part, for most college multis, um, I would say as they get to this elite level, most of the time in the United States, our weakness is our throws for the combined events. Um, it, it seems to be one of our, our limiting factors um, as, we, as we go to compete against those from Europe and stuff like that. Yeah, that seems like a kind of a natural segue to talking a little bit more nuts and bolts of what, you know, you maybe touched, scratched the surface a little bit, but what are some of your, you know, guiding philosophies on training, you know, combined event athletes and, um, you know, some of your staples on how you go about, you know, arranging training and, and making these already talented, you know, combined event athletes take that step to the next level. Sure. Um, I'd say that in the, be in the beginning of training, I'm, I'm probably fairly similar to, to most people. Like a lot of our fall training um, is just a lot of tendon strengthening work, trying to prep the body so that they can last through, through a long season. Um, we are a little bit different than I would say college. You know, a lot of you guys are starting in like August and September. Uh, but usually we're just coming home from a world championships or something like that at that time. So um, I usually give them like a month off um, where I don't care what they're doing. Just go be you and go explore the world or whatever you got to do. Um, and then depending on the year, um, depending on if there's a world indoor or not, um, depending on what time frame uh, the world championships and the U.S. championships are at, uh, we'll either reconvene in October or November and we'll start training then. Um, uh, but like I said, like a lot of that is just a lot of, of general conditioning. Uh, we're going to spend time throughout the week, um, just doing circuits, tendon strengthening, core strengthening. Um, it's a good time, especially for like in the javelin. Um, I actually have a, a young lady that, uh, we met in Great Britain, um, that she's our, basically like our javelin mobility specialist. And so we do Zoom calls with her and we're doing a lot of um, just different thoracic mobility, shoulder mobility, um, stuff like that, just so that we can um, get into better positions. Because uh, especially for, I would say, the heptathletes, most of them didn't grow up throwing things at all, <laughs> which puts the United States at such a disadvantage. <laughs> um, and so... And it's, it's even been shown, I, I read a couple of studies that um, that kind of the shoulder, like, I guess I don't want to use the wrong terminology, like that shoulder socket right there where the humerus is, is guiding around. If you don't actually throw things when you are young, um, it actually doesn't open up on the backside a little bit. And so like the range of motion uh, for like the javelin is, is really kind of limited. Um, and there's really not a lot you can do because the you've never really kind of opened up that capsule enough to allow for a little bit more movement for the throwing motion. Um, and so usually that's when you're going to get some of that um, impingement on the back for, for some of your girl throwers. And so we spent a lot of time just on the mobility um, in the fall, just to try and see if we can open that up just a little bit more, um, especially, especially for, for that event. Um, and then even then it's, um, it's good to kind of teach the athletes um, how to, to care uh, for this whole uh, upper body with regards to um, learning how to self move like pec minor, pec major, uh, you know, rear delts and, and stuff like that, um, just so that they can make sure that they keep things released, um, especially in this day and age where everyone's kind of hunched over on their phones, you're already creating uh, an environment for not being able to throw well. Um, just this whole forward uh, impingement here. Um, if, if they're kind of like already set with the shoulder blades forward and they don't have a great ability to kind of open up and, and use those rhomboids and the, and the scaps the correct way and set the position, um, it makes it very difficult um, for them to be in the position that you want them to be. It's, it's very difficult for them to uh, and again, I'm still talking, I guess, javelin. It's very difficult for them to leave the javelin behind um, as, they, as they go to do the throwing motion. And so um, I focus a lot on just developing an environment in the fall um, so that they can have success later in, in all the different events. Um, 
I guess that would be kind of like the, the throwing uh, philosophy in the fall. And like I said, we, we throw, we don't necessarily throw the implements right away. Uh, we throw a lot of baseballs just to get the throwing motion. Baseball throwing is not like throwing the javelin, but it is throwing. And so, and it's light enough that it usually doesn't aggravate um, a multi-event shoulder. Um, and so we'll just play catch close and then we'll just kind of step it off and, and get better at that. And, and even then, like, I find that I try to then modify how they do it. I was like, oh, you know what? Let's start trying to, you know, throw the, the baseball, but I want the elbow to be above the level of the shoulder when you deliver the, the baseball to me. And they're like, oh, okay, why? And it's like, just playing catch a different way. <laughs> you know but it's like then in their mind you're already starting to at least try to to put into their um kind of motor programming that when we go to deliver something throwing that i want it <laughs> up of the shoulder so that hopefully we're not you know getting tommy john surgery at some point <laughs> so um so yeah like and like i said so in the fall you know we're doing that at least two to three times a week and then we're doing a lot of just general body conditioning and running because I feel like we, we need to put up a, a base of work. So that's where we're running. I don't know, like three sets of three, three hundreds, you know, two minutes rest. And basically my cues for them are always just try to hit the same time the entire time. I'm not one to be like, you got to hit this time. You got to hit this pace because you never really know um, how recovered someone is. And so, it, and it, I, I took this a little bit from um, Bulgarian weightlifting where they did a max test every single day before they set the percentages for what the workouts were for that day. So that tells me that, you know, they always wanted to know what was your ability that day before training. And so while I can't do necessarily a max test, I can always ask that instead of assigning them a um, particular time I can say look I need you to give me an effort that is uh, strong but you believe you can hit for all nine reps yeah and then if you can the next time we'll try and go a little bit faster and so we kind of allow them to establish what kind of pace they can hit and it also is a good thing for for a multi or to actually be able to get a good concept in their body a good feel for what is pacing mm, yeah and even then pacing is something that is a feel in all events like there's a rhythm and a pace to how to deliver a throw there's a rhythm and a pace to the long jump approach there's a rhythm and a pace to, to a lot of your races um so i i feel like you can you can try to explain and and um, take those concepts and you can then apply them um, across all the different events in the multis. Nice. Uh, one thing you mentioned kind of is speaking about like throws training philosophy is, is trying to work every event or at least all the throws weekly from the beginning. Is that, uh, maybe you're just using it as an example or is that one of your kind of set philosophies for the throws? And if so, like how do you go about doing that? and working that in in such a tight you know um training environment with so much competing for your limited training time sure um yeah it is i, I do think uh and it doesn't actually like i said it doesn't necessarily have to be with the implement um we could be throwing med balls we could be throwing baseballs um we could be throwing footballs we could be playing frisbee uh you know we could be as long as we're throwing something um, I feel it's good. Uh, I get a lot of girls that play volleyball. So, you know, sometimes we'll play volleyball. Uh, again, the overhead strike is still <laughs> up here and it's still a snap. So, you know, it's very much like delivering the javelin, you know, so I, I feel like there's a lot of things um, that you can do. If, if we want to, if I want to have it be like, again, that's great because I'm trying to just work on strengthening and getting mobility up top. But obviously the throw comes from the legs and so that's where um, all the med ball stuff comes in so we'll do a lot of like uh, hip throws we're working on you know throwing with the hip uh, we'll do a shot put variation of that where it's still you know hip oriented learning how to you know stop the left to speed up the right we got to learn how to use our block leg correctly so 
a lot of the, the drills and, and things that I do with the med balls um, are really just to help um, reinforce eventually what we're going to be doing uh, out in the rings or on the runway. Nice. But even, even with all the events that we have to do, um, we do try to hit um, them at least once per week. And then sometimes we'll do it twice. With the heptathletes, typically when they're beginners, uh, we'll probably throw the shot put twice a week. Um, and then we'll throw the javelin once a week. And then we'll do some other form of throwing, baseball throwing usually, um, to make up for the second uh, javelin kind of day. Um, we'll do that a lot in the fall. We'll try to actually hit them twice a week. Uh, when it comes to the deck guys, um, usually I'll, I'll try to figure out which throwing event is kind of their weakest. And that'll be the one that typically we'll probably hit twice a week um, yeah. just to kind of get a better feel uh, for the event. And then we'll hit the other ones once to twice. Um, but it is, it is obviously a lot of people, you, you got a lot of options when it comes to designing the, your plan for the multis. You can try and stick with a, a seven day, um, I guess, micro. Uh, but sometimes it's easier to go to a 14 day because then you have so much time to get stuff in. <laughs> then you don't have to be so worried uh, about like, oh, I got to get this in uh, this week. And I think that's, that's one of the main things like when you're coaching the combined events is you have to make sure that whether you're working on, you know, the, the full macro cycle or your micro cycle for the month or however you like to do it. Like we, I've done you know, four week cycles, we're now moving into three week cycles, just because I always tend to notice that that third week in a four week cycle, they're pretty, they're pretty toast. So and, you know, I've had a lot of good mentors like Harry Mara that, you know, said, well, you know, eventually I moved Ash into three week cycles, and he loved it. <laughs> that's what <laughs> broke the world record. I was like, well, that's enough for me. <laughs> so, um, but I think you just have to, you have to figure out because every athlete is different. Um, some people do handle the extra volume and, and some people absolutely do not. Um, but there's no reason to, to beat the horse. And, uh, you know, it's much better to be recovered and, and getting in good training that's consistent over time uh, than to have, you know, wow, I had this amazing week where we just got all this work in. And then the next week they couldn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so... I think, I think a lot of, a lot of training, uh, for the multis needs to be such that you realize that this is a process and this process is going to take time. And so when you do that, and then you start thinking each week and even each day, okay, what is the goal that I want to accomplish this week? I know I have all these other things that I want to get in, but what is the actual thing that I need to make sure that I, I accomplish this week? And then the coach has to make sure that you stick with it. Cause that's sometimes I think the hardest with the combined events, cause you'll start doing something and then all of a sudden you'll see something you're like, Ooh, I think I could fix that. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not what we came here to do today. We came here just to work on, on this and allow it to, to progress. And if you can, and I, I make the mistake too. Like there are times where I completely go off what I was like, that's our goal for the day. That's what we're going to do. And I see something like, Nope, I'm going that way. <laughs> but sometimes that's the art of coaching. Cause yeah. sometimes it's like, but maybe that was a good choice on your part because maybe what you were working on was a great concept of a goal of what you wanted to get done. But then sometimes you notice like, well, wait a second, maybe if I work on this first, it's going to make attaining that goal easier. Right. And so that's, I think that's what you develop over time uh, with coaching is, is the, is the sense of, I know I wrote this great training plan, but you'll, I mean, my athletes can attest to this. Like it always says tentative on the top, <laughs> tentative training plan. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think that's great perspective for the throws coach who might work with the multis too, or, you know, the combined event athletes on their team, because I mean, I, you know, reminding yourself a, that it's going to take time, you know, especially when you might be working with your dedicated throwers 80% of the time and have your combined event kids come over that 20% of the time. It's like, I mean, my personal experience, it's been, it's really easy to be like, oh man, like X, Y, Z are all important. We need to do them all. And like, you know, 
taking that step back, we're like, okay, we got to scale this a little bit. Like what's the one thing that we think we can make progress on? I think that's hits the nail on the head for, you know, the, the throws coach that might be working with the multis and just what can we do? And no, that's great. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, and when it comes to, you know, if you are, cause like I coach all events for the multis, I don't, they don't get, you know, put here and there. And luckily I've done that my entire career. I've never had the, the setting where I just coach them in certain events and I would ask a, like the throws coach to take them. Um, but if, if I did, I would always make sure to remind the throws coach that they're not throwers, they're multi-eventers. And so you have to find a way to um, really, I mean, it's, it's the KISS principle. You just got to keep it simple. And, and that's the best way to coach the, the multis. You got to think of bare bones, easy cues that are going to, you know, that the multis are going to understand. And that's where the communication between the throws coach and their main coach um, can help, uh, at least with regards to relating the throws back to maybe something that they already understand really well. Yeah. Um, whether it's, you know, a line of force or if it's a rhythm or, you um, yeah, I, I just, I just feel like sometimes, and I, and I see it all the time because, you know, obviously I was a pole vaulter. So when I get to the pole vault with the multis, I just want to start, you know, spewing pole vaults all over them, but you have to, you really have to make sure that you hold back all that extra phlegm <laughs> and, and you just, and you just talk to them in, in very simple terms. And, and again, and just realize that it's going to take time and that you're going to have to come up with different strategies sometimes to get the multi eventer to, to improve. Now on that line, obviously every athlete's different, but do you have one or two things in each of the throwing events that you feel like is a particularly important thing that, you know, multis or any thrower like has to do right to throw far, you know, thing consider like more so with the multis of like, you know, what's the one thing, you know, or sure. a commonality that you see that, you know, they, they generally do well if they're going to throw far. Right. I, I think the first thing that you got to remember, and I think I talked a little bit about it, is that the combined eventers are, are a different breed than your throwers. Yeah. They need to learn how to throw uh, reflexively which I mean, obviously the throwers need to as well, but we don't have as much strength to back up that. So we have to, we have to really understand how to wind up the body and utilize that stretch reflex cycle and, and really um, gain extra power um, from that. Um, you know, the, the reaction, the reactiveness of, of the body has to be all lined up. And that's what you can teach a multi-eventer. Um, cause you can't just take a girl and get her to go from benching, you know, 60 pounds to 185 pounds. And there you go. You got the extra strength and, and she's going to throw really far. Um, you know, it just, you got to find ways to teach them kind of, it's gotta be timing. So you, when you teach them, you got to make sure that, that you teach them the sequencing of, of those events. And luckily for most of the throws, that sequencing is fairly similar. Mm -hmm. So if you can teach them the, the sequencing of, of the events uh, of the limbs, um, then it, I think it tends to, it tends to carry over. Um, I, I don't really have any people that spin in the shot put. We mess around with it just for fun. <laughs> um, but what I like doing with it is it's just one other way to teach them how to keep the shot like behind their hip and let the hip lead the action. And so I, I find that um, for a glider, sometimes it's fun just to spin to see one, how bad are they at it? And then, but if they can figure out very grossly how to, to land in that power position, I do think that the spin actually can teach them how to keep it back for longer. They're not so quick to try and push on that in that shot, which you can sometimes get in the, in the glide, because they like to, they like to speed up that, that action. At least most uh, combined eventers do that, at least that I've worked with. They're always so quick to, as soon as they start pushing that hip, they're already starting to push on, 
on that shot. And I'm like, there's gotta be some separation here <laughs> before you start, you know, striking. Uh, it needs to be that kind of that last thing that happens, you know, and it's, and it's even the, and the same thing for like the guys uh, in the discus, you know, it's like, okay, balance is so important. Posture is so important. And they hear that all the time in all their other events. And so they really grab onto that. And if you can, in the discus, if, if they're finding their posture as they move through the center, if they know that they have to hit certain positions, I think that they feed off of that a little bit more, a combined eventer does, because they understand posture. They typically understand, um, you know, if you talk to them about, you know, driving through the center, um, you know, and relating it to another event. Um, when you talk to them about, you know, well, we got to make sure that the foot is down before, you know, left foot is down before we start to initiate the hip for the throw, you know, they then start to grasp certain concepts and, and you just have to build upon that and develop drill series that you feel comfortable with teaching um, and think that the multi venter will um, pick up on. Because um, I've, I've tried going through a progression that I've, you know, maybe heard another throws coach going I'm just like yeah I don't, I don't like that one and I don't think that that's a waste of time for me because you know again for combined events you only have a certain amount of time yeah. so you got to be as efficient as possible and you've got to pick out okay that drill is important because it teaches this I'm going to use this drill because it teaches this I know there's all these other drills out there but I got to kind of just swim through it all and find the ones that one you feel confident in teaching and confident that it teaches the skill set that you're trying to apply mm -hmm. to the to the thrower yeah so, so you you find uh significant value in, in having like drill series although maybe truncated or very specific for the multis um, and how much full throwing you know do you do as a percentage of your you know throws training um i i would still say that 50 percent or more of our throwing is still fulls um but i would say that for the multi-eventer we do it with all underweight implements mm. um especially especially for the the newer heptathletes and decathletes um you know if they've never really thrown anything and they're not the strongest person in the world why would you just dump a 16 pound shot in this dude's hand <laughs> Uh, so I start with six K's for the guys build up to a 14 and then to a 15. Um, and really when you're throwing a 15 pound shot in practice, it's fairly similar to a, an adrenaline, uh, juiced up guy in the, in the ring. You're like, you're just like, yeah, 16 pound goes just as far as the 15. So, um, and the same thing for the girls, I'll start with a three K we'll work up to a three, five. And I find that for the most part, if we just throw three fives, um, that they throw the 4K just fine. Nice. Um, doesn't mean that we don't touch the 4K. Um, just means that, you know, and kind of same thing in the, we throw, um, we throw 500 gram javelins, 700 gram javelins, um, all a little bit underweight. I start off with uh, one five discs, work our way up to one sevens, one eights, um, mm -hmm. before we hit to the, to the two. Obviously, if you can find diameters that are all the same uh, as what you want to compete with, uh, that's that's preferable. Yeah. Um, I think that way you're always used to the same pressure in your hand or in your fingers and, and stuff like that. Um, but sometimes you just got to make do. You know, maybe you can't get find a 109, but you can find a 108. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> even though even though Annie, one of my heptathletes, she says I can feel the difference. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sure you can, <laughs> but. We gotta so, deal with it. Um, that's great. And do you have any, like, when you're putting together a throws practice, is it generally a dedicated session or coming back or later in the day after a speed work session? Or do you have certain things you feel like pair really well together? Sure. Um, it depends on the time of year. Uh, sometimes it's the first thing that we do during the day because I want them to be freshest uh, for the throw session. Um, and then sometimes, especially once we kind of get through that fall training or heading into that pre comp comp phase, uh, I, my philosophy is to teach based off of how the events are in order and by day. Um, and so for instance, we do a lot of just Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday type of training. 
where we come out Monday and I can either decide to do take all the day one events and split them up in order over Monday and Tuesday, or I can take a couple of events from day one and do them on Monday, and then a couple of events from day two and do them on Tuesday. Have a recovery day, then come back on Thursday and Friday and kind of repeat the same thing. Um, and again, what events you choose uh, is kind of up to you. Um, for the girls, for instance, um, we probably always start a Monday off with a hurdle session and then we may go do high jump approaches and then move right to the shot put, or we could do a hurdle session. That's very light where maybe we're just doing block starts over one and we may only do like three or four just to get them in the mindset to always remember you start day one with the hurdles always. And then we may go on, uh, have a heavy, um, volume of throwing. Uh, if that's what the goal is for that day, uh, we got to get in a lot of throws. We haven't, you know, I want to build up some volume of throws, um, you know, but again, maybe you want to get them used to the transition of high jumping and then moving to the shot put. That's also, you know, very viable um, thing that you can do. Um, or if you've decided to split day one up over Mon uh, Monday and Tuesday, maybe you're going to do hurdles and high jump on Monday and then you can come back on Tuesday and you can open up with that shot sesh and then you can have your 200 meter workout. So you got speed endurance going there and then you got that day off to recover from that speed endurance workout and then you can come back and you can attack day two events. So I, I feel like there's, there's multiple ways to really um, design the training and especially with the, the decathletes, um, it allows you to um, just figure out different ways to put together your training. Uh, I think there's a lot of variability in training that way. And so there, it's not like they always know, well, ah, Monday, we're going to do this <laughs> Tuesday. We're going to do this. You know, it's like they typically I'll send out their thing and they always kind of know, well, this is when my recovery day is. And that's all they really care about. <laughs> They're like, just tell me what I'm doing when I get there. But I know that Wednesday or Thursday is my recovery day and Sunday's off. So <laughs> you know so they they sometimes build on that um and then sometimes i'll i'll use even though it's a recovery day um i may uh throw i like to throw discus on a recovery day um mm -hmm. because i feel like when we're throwing discus like i said most of the time i'm just working on posture and balance um i'm not necessarily looking for big throws we're usually maybe throwing just into the net um you know, and so they, I feel like for a multi eventer getting them comfortable moving through the ring and hitting positions in balance is way more important than that disc is going far at first. They have to really, because if they, if they have a big throw and, but they don't know why it went far, I think that's a problem. They have to have a good general feel of why that went far. And if it just goes far and it's just because they got lucky because somehow the disc was way back and somehow even they just timed up their random reverse with it and it just sent it that little bit further and they're like oh man i gotta do it and then you look on video and it's like their left foot wasn't down and they were leaning forward into the center of the ring and they just happened to get lucky and catch it somehow without falling out of the ring like for the most part like you don't want to be the one hit wonder you want to like in the multi-events <laughs> it's so important to learn how to compete at a high level in all your events. Um, and so we talk about percentages all the time. So, um, and increasing our average. So I could care less if their PR is, you know, say it's 8350. Okay, well, what was your average for the de decathlon that year? Well, I had an 8350, a 7800, and an 8000. Okay, so basically you're about an 8000 point guy then. Oh no, coach, I scored 8350. No, you're an 8,000 point guy in my book. Um, so, and, and you can even take that and apply it to all the events in the, in the multi events. Um, you know, what's your PR in the hurdles during the multis? I think that's important too, because they're going to probably have potentially different PRs in and out of the multis. And then your goal, and, and this is the best part about the multis is my goal is always, well, I want your average to get better in your events each year. And if I get your averages better in all your events, then that should mean that your multi, you know, your combined event score will also get um, better. And when you look at, and I did this a lot with the pole vault. If you look at uh, most of the, like of the years, if you take the average of all 
all the top 10 pole vaulters and you average all their competitive heights and comes up with the number, the three people that have the highest averages are typically the people that made the team. And I would be willing to bet that if you did that in the throws, it's, it's very similar. That the person that averaged the highest, you know, obviously you'll get an outlier. Um, there's gonna be, but for the most part, I would say that two out of the three of those positions are always one of your um, top three highest, highest average. So I think it's really important that people focus on, and that's where this whole process thing is, right? Don't focus on outcomes, focus or result oriented uh, training, focus on uh, the process. Because if you can get those averages up, then you know that one, at least especially at the level that I'm coaching, you're, you're gonna create an athlete that's gonna stay viable in the sport for longer because they're not gonna just be this, oh, I scored really big and then they suck. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna be able to compete at a high level all the time. And that's what it takes to, to make money in track and field. You have to be able to compete at a high level, you know, when it counts and that average has to be high in order to do it yeah. and that's a it's a very good example of you know even if you take like ashton and roman chevrolet and a lot of those guys those guys were such speed and power oriented kind of decathletes and you think kevin meyer and it's like how did that guy break the world record let alone crush it and it was just he was on such a high level on all the events across the board, he wasn't great in any of them. Mm -hmm. but man, he was really good in all of them. <laughs> sometimes that's all it takes, you know. It's like there's, and that's the cool thing, right, about the multi events. There are so many different ways to score high. <laughs> yeah. But when you get to that top echelon level, like you know, when I'm trying to get someone to score, you know, 6,800 plus in the HEP and 6,500 or 8,500 plus in the deck, it's like, ooh, we got to tweak a little thing here. We got to hope for this and. But again, it's that confidence in knowing that they can do it uh, day in and day out at a high level. And that even when they have a bad day, it's not going to dip all that much. Yeah. And that's really what um, my training philosophy, I guess, is, is I'm really trying to teach these kids how to compete at a high level consistently and not just be this, this one hit wonder during the year. Um, for the combined events, if they want to be able to like make money in the combined events and they want to place high in the combined events challenge, you know, they take your, they take your two best multis and then they average those scores. And that's how you kind of get your world rankings. Um, if they want to place high in the combined events challenge, they take your three best scores at combined events challenge meets and they add all three up. And then that's how you kind of rank in the combined events challenge. So I think it's a good it's a good thing. I think they do the same thing possibly in the hammer challenge. Um, you know, when, when you look at that. So, um, it's, it's really important to me to, to really get them to hone in that this is a, this is a process. It takes time, but over time you may not PR and everything, but your average just has to go up. And so, and I guess an example of this would be like when I got, uh, Erica Bogard to come to the center in 2017, um, she had scored 62.50, I think, but her average was always like 59 something. She'd have a big 6,000, you know, 200 or whatever. She'd have a 5,800. She'd have a maybe a 6,000, but it was it was kind of low. So then I was like, okay, look, like we're gonna just teach you to get better over time. Um, and so that first year, I think uh, we went to text relay. She scored. 6290. So she was like, ah, oh, I PR'd. I was like, well, that's good, but we gotta make sure that it's an upward trend on this on this <laughs> average. Um, and so we started there, and then I wanna say we went to uh Gautzis for the first time, which was awesome. And there she scored 6505. And she's like, I PR'd again. I say, <laughs> I was like, hold on now. <laughs> We're trying to get our average up. Um, and then we went to USA's and she scored. I think 65, 55. And so she was kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm hitting this trend. We go to Worlds and she only scores 6,010. Mm -hmm. She barely breaks 6,000. She's like, oh man, whew, it's good to be, uh, you know, 65. I was like, well, technically you're now a 6,300 <laughs> point of Tathy. She's like, what are you talking about? I scored twice over. I was like, yeah, but we averaged everything. Yeah. And so then the next year, uh, happened to be a pretty good year i think we opened up at like 64 
and then she scored 67-25 at Gosses. And then USA, she scored 64 again. It was in 2018. So it was, you know, no world championships. So I was like, good. You did PR, yes. And your average got better. You had two 64s and you guys did it. But you're not meddling yet because the person that is beating you has an average of 65 to 6,600. And you're still a 6,400 point heptathlete. She's like, oh, next year comes, which was last or two years ago, 2019, um, she scores a 64 high, a 66, and a 65. So again, gets up to that 6,500 average now. So our average, can you get better? This year, we never PR'd, but our average got better. So I was still stoked and she was happy. And she plays fourth at Worlds. And I was like, do you know why you got fourth at Worlds? My average still isn't high enough. <laughs> I was like, you're right. Verena scored 6,500 plus all three times. I was like, you have this lone 6,400 that we have to learn to, to continue to build up. If you want a medal in Tokyo, we have to get those averages up even more. And so I think she's a good example of progressing, attaining PBs, and then sometimes not attaining PBs, but the average goes up. It's gotta sometimes, be a, and sometimes that comes from actually because our throws got better because that's usually where we have to get better at <laughs> in order to compete with the Europeans. That's got to be a more like mentally sustainable way to train too post collegiately because if you have, you know, some of these, you look at some of those individual performances where you might have run a stellar hurdle time or a stellar high jump. It's like, well, how am I going to improve on that? You know what I mean? Enough right. to make up another 70 or 80 points. Like, but if you, you know, I mean, we had a, not to divert too much, but we had a, I coached division three. So the numbers are scaled a little bit, but we had a heptathlete, you know, be qualified for nationals a couple of years ago, jumping one, seven, six in the high jump. You know, she's pretty good high jumper out of high school. That's what she did. And then um, it was kind of like, where do we go from here? There wasn't a whole lot of room left in her high jump, but the next year, but she also threw 17 meters in the javelin. So, you know, we... <laughs> The next year, she threw, I think she jumped 170 in the high jump, you know, at a qualifier, but threw 27 meters in the javelin or something like that. It's like, if you can find a way mentally to look at that as an average, as opposed to not one good and one bad, then yeah. it's got to be mentally. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it, it can be difficult, you know, because sometimes, especially if one of their events that they really like starts to kind of just kind of hover there. Um, that, that can be hard. So that's where like making sure that you do continue to focus on their strengths. You can't just, you know, keep trying to build up these weaknesses. You have to make sure that they have success in their uh, strong events. Um, luckily for me, most of my athletes are very good hurdlers and, and are decent high jumpers or really good high jumpers. And so at least in the, in the HEP that, that gets you going real strong. And usually if you can make sure that you you know, hit those first two events strong. Usually when they get to the shop, but they're just so like amped up, they usually perform pretty well just because we're good. But I always, I always am like, man, like sometimes I wish we'd go and maybe one of those first events wouldn't go well, just so that I can see how they respond to that sort of environment. Mm. Um, and, and luckily it did happen for, for Erica once she, she hit a hurdle and stumbled. And so, um, she still ran a decent time. I mean, she still ran 13, five, but she was on pace to run like, I think 12, 90 something. So <laughs> she was like, Oh, it's all over. <laughs> I was like, you don't know that yet. Um, and then high jump went decent, but then she threw a PR in the shot put. And then she ended up PRing in every single event and ended up getting a heptathlon on PB. And so I liked the fact that I have that card now in her back pocket. I was like, look, Remember that time where hurdles and high jump didn't go that great and you still set a PB in the hep? You always have that card in your back pocket from yeah. now on. That's great. Um, one other thing I was curious about is, you know, your strength training work. Um, not to pivot too much, but it's a, it's okay. a somewhat significant pivot. But, you know, I think that's one area that like the, the strength is one of the biggest differences in a thrower versus a combined event athlete. Um, curious what your strength training looks like with your crew and if there are ways that you're kind of specifically addressing the throws and, and you know, bridging, like, you know, bolstering their, their strength there to specifically target the throws or is it more just general development or 
Yeah. So it's, uh, so I have, uh, I work with a strength coach at the center, uh, Jamie Myers and him and I discuss it. And, and we've always been kind of the philosophy that the, that the weight room is really just supplemental because we do so much out at the track. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's, it's, again, it's a very slow methodical process and, um, we don't max, we don't, you know, and a lot of it is still about just moving things fast. So I prefer lighter weights, uh, moving things fast. Um, you know, we do, we start with, uh, you know, double support and then we move the single support movements uh, for strength, at least like in the squats and the step ups and stuff like that. Um, we, for every, pressing motion we do we typically do two pulling motions just because again we found that because of this tendency for them to always be forward with their posture as it is i need to open that up with two pulls so that i can push once <laughs> so um we've had to modify like you know, for some reason the girls uh struggle with actually benching with a regular bar so i don't know what this bar is called but it has like multiple handles in it mm, yeah. so my girls used uh that for benching and that allows them to kind of get stronger uh in the bench that way uh, i'd say it's very bare bones like meat and potatoes kind of work in the weight room um uh like Mondays will be like a, a power clean day or just a pull day. Um, you know, some years uh, we'll actually catch um, and sometimes we won't because all we really need is the development of the power off the ground. We don't, uh, this year we're catching because I thought, well, you know, maybe if we catch, we're going to be teaching the body a little bit more about bracing for that force impact um more like in the high jump and stuff like that and so we've been playing around with that uh but then i've also you know i I've, I've gotten too many injuries because of of catching sometimes you know they'll catch one bad and then next thing you know their their shot put wrist is a little jacked up because you know they caught it a little bit wrong uh or they're you know as they as they caught it um maybe they caught a little low and their first response was a quick little, you know, hunch in the back versus, you know, just driving the elbows and, and driving the hips. And, you know, it's, for me, it's just, and, and even, and I guess the best part about my strength coach is like, he's like, I completely understand. He's just like, if they get in here, hurt in here, it's my fault. <laughs> I was like, well, technically it's still my fault, but um, you know, we, we worked really well together with regards to just designing a plan that, that I feel, confident and comfortable with um i've done it other ways where like you know we did the whole um we would we would clean squat and bench sometimes like three times a week different variations i did i used to do that in at cincinnati and i saw some success with that and then some people just didn't you know didn't recover from it and then when i got here um i tried it a little bit with with jeremy tylo and he saw a lot of success with it at first but then i realized that I probably should have faded away from that as we moved more into the competitive season. So kind of more like what Jamie uh, does with regards to just moving things fast and keeping it light and keeping them healthy. So that way they can accomplish what it is I want to get done out on the track. Um, but yeah, so like I usually start with four days uh, a week uh, in the fall. We'll go Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, everything's designed so that we're in and out of the weight room in like 30 minutes maybe 40 um, because we're doing um, but like they'll literally come in and it'll be okay today would be like power clean day and then maybe they got some like a pull and um, some sort of core work and then that's it and the next day we come in and it might be our bench press day and then on the bench press day we're doing some sort of pull-up series and more core work and then uh thursday would be like a step up day and a dynamic day so maybe like dumbbell like jump squats and and heavy step ups different levels of step up variations depending on the time of year mm -hmm. um and then friday would probably be our our squat day uh, we decided to go with front squats this year before we've done box squats we've done back squats we've done uh just deadlift or uh, trap bar uh, a lot of different variations but 
um, we kind of stick to it just like one thing each day and we don't stack them. Um, and I don't think you necessarily have to just because if you're doing enough training out on the track, you're getting already so much of, of what you already need. Um, I think, do they need to get stronger, the combined eventers? Absolutely. Um, if you have the time and you know you've got a full cycle where maybe you could just make the focus of the weight room, then go for it. And I've done that in the past. Like I remember I talked to Jamie one year. I was like, okay, I feel like maybe we've got the time. I'm going to bring them back in October instead of November, but October, we're just going to be doing like easy strides and stuff out on the track. But I want you to kind of go for it here in the weight room a little bit and, and see if we get any strength gains out of them a little bit more of a high, like we don't usually do too much of a hypertrophy phase for the multis. Um, we, we just kind of, uh, develop it over time. And so I, I know that's probably a little bit different than what a lot of people would do. Um, yeah, it's very different from what I do, but it's a very different like, uh, environment too, you know, like, which is very interesting. It's fun to hear. Like the only way I can work with my students in September and October from our conference regulations is in the weight room. So right. Like a great time. Uh, yeah. So you gotta, you gotta kind of, you know, you gotta know what are my limitations? What, yeah. what, can you, what are the rules for me? And then I'm <laughs> going to make something work. And, and that's how, that's how I am. Like, if you told me that that's all I could do, then, then I would figure out ways in the weight room to accomplish what I, what I'm trying to do. Um, so, I mean, obviously now I'm, it's funny, I'm not bound by certain hours or anything like that, but I'd say sometimes we actually work out less than we, I used to in, in the college setting. It was kind of like in the college setting, I was like, whew, when I got 20 hours a week, I got to make use of this 20 hours. <laughs> and, and now sometimes even with the combined events where, you know, I need to have multiple practices a day, I'm still finding a way to just keep it, to, you know, maybe 16 hours a week, you know, obviously some weeks we got to go over. Um, but I don't necessarily include the times that, you know, they're going to sports med and, and they're doing maybe prehab or, you know, they're working on the little tiny things, you know, intrinsic training that they need to be doing for their individual. Because at my level, everybody's got nicks and pains and <laughs> something that they got to do prehab for uh, in order to be successful. So that's very cool. Uh, one more question that popped in my mind on the strength side is when you're talking about you, you did more of like the raw strength or the, you know, hypertrophy and max strength work at Cincinnati. Do you feel like that's a, just a difference in the environment or maybe the level of athlete? Do you feel like that max strength work becomes more or less important as you work with the higher level athletes? I, I think. I think I was, I think I was playing around with a lot of stuff in my coaching career. So I was trying to figure out, you know, basically, you know, how do I get the, the best response out of training? And I, and I think that some of these student athletes, they need that kind of, you know, regiment in order to get stronger, to get more powerful, to feel confident. Um, for, and even sometimes at the elite level, because, um, you know, one year, uh, Kendall Williams and Devin Williams joined our group. Um, and my, that's probably the main thing that's different between me and Petros is that Petros is huge in the weight room. He's all, you know, and, and, and so much so that sometimes they're like, well, if I'm not cleaning or squatting this much before my major competition, I know I'm not going to do well. It's like, whoa, like <laughs> that's a different mindset that I've, you know, that I've, I've never really heard before. Um, and so that was, that was unique to me because I was like, okay, so you know, so I told Jamie that, and, you know, we tried to take a little bit of what we do, but add a little bit more in for them because that's what they were used to doing. And that's what gave them confidence. And so I, I do think that, again, you got to figure out what works best for, for each of the athlete. I know that's so hard, especially when you have a large group and, and you got to try and be like, okay, this is what we're doing because that's the only way I'm going to be able to <laughs> take care of all of you people. Um, but I do think that, especially if you're getting the, the high schooler that never lifted, I think you got to have a good lifting program when they get to college and, and they have to do it safely. Like they're going to just need probably a good, um, you know, almost like bodybuilding kind of just general strength in the weight room to kind of just build that tissue and, and get stronger. And then, 
teach them the fundamentals of all the Olympic lifts so they actually know how to do it correctly instead of, you know, there, it's funny because there's so many times that they come to the center and I am like, oh, wow, you know, they come from, you know, a really good track program. And then they get here and we're watching them in, in the weight room. And it's like, did no one teach you how to power clean? <laughs> you know, it's like the yeah. movements and the patterns are just are, are off. And um, so we end up teaching them all over again. And so, um, and I don't know if it's because they're multis, and, you know, and, and again, maybe the weight room is just one more thing they got to do. And so they just go in and the strength coach is like, we got like 30 minutes. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And, you know, they don't have the time to, to teach them that but i think that it's so important even just to start with different bar patterns and don't let them progress to you know heavier weights until they establish the patterns that you think are appropriate uh and safe um because the number one place you don't want a track athlete to get hurt on is in, is in the weight room like <laughs> that's not their environment you know if they get hurt out on the track well you don't want that either but you know at least they were attempting to do something maybe at a new level out on the track and you know they just weren't prepared for it i don't know but i don't like injuries don't get don't quote me there but you know i hate to say that that's where i prefer it to happen but you know it's i definitely don't want it happening in the weight room um and i just i just feel like there's a, a good opportunity to teach progressions just like you do out on the track in the weight room you know, teach them how to, you know, move the bar with the body correctly, teach them the patterns of where the bar should be, whether it's, you know, you know, even teaching them how to, to brush the upper thigh versus bounce it off the lower thigh when doing a, a power clean is, is a huge, you know, technical difference um, that can make a long-term um, gain in their career, you know, so taking the time to make sure that, you um, start with the bar. If the bar is even too heavy for some of the girls, start with a PVC pipe, you know, again, that's what they start training with in Bulgaria with the little kids, you know, everyone's learning with PVC pipes. So, um, I think, I think you can learn a lot from other sports and, and watching how they develop their athletes. I think, um, I think that's, that's key. I think that multi-sport, um, theories can can actually if you take the time to study how someone else does something um even like like a speed skater uh, we had a we had a guy uh, a strength coach that that interned with us and now he's the head of u.s speed skating uh weight you know, strength and conditioning and so just to see like i was like okay well you worked with track and how what did you do to then apply that to, to your speed skaters he's like well okay well you got to think of it now they're hunched over and they do so much more lateral side to side movement. So, you know, we just started changing up the patterns of how we squatted, you know, our, our box step ups are to the side instead of just straight up and down, you know, forward, you know, I had to make sure that, you know, he looked at the plane of movement that, that his athletes were working in. And I think, you know, that's the same thing that all coaches should do. Like if you break down, you know, the throw, or if you break down, a jump and you got, you know, you got to look at, okay, well, I'm in this plane of movement. What move, what plane shouldn't I have movement in and which way do I need to get stronger in? Uh, and is it, is it a thing that, you know, in order to control rotation, I need to have a stronger core. Is it, you know, in order to control rotation, I have to minimize movement with a limb, you know, there's a, there's many different ways. And so um, those are the things that, I think you can you can use the weight room in order to sometimes try to apply that you know out on out on the track nice very cool thanks um i don't want to take too much more of your time but you know could you give us maybe to to wrap up just an update on like how's your how's your crew doing you know what are you guys working towards or working on right now and how have you been able to navigate this COVID 19 messiness sure um <laughs> Uh, I got a good crew right now. Um, I guess I should introduce them first. Uh, in the heptathlon, I've got Erica Bugard. Um, she's ranked number four in the world currently. Um, she finished fourth in Doha at the World Championships. Um, she is obviously where she has the A standard. So obviously our goal is just to get to Olympic trials and place top three so we can make the Olympics and, and go to Tokyo. 
Um, I work with Annie Kuntz. Um, she was on fire last year. She, uh, she won the USA Indoor Championships in the pentathlon with a huge PB of 46.10 um, and looked to be on point and progress to score that uh, 64.20. Um, then COVID hit and that was, that was brutal, but she stayed super mentally tough during COVID and she found ways to keep training at parks and, and finding ways to get it done. Um, I, luckily she was up in San Clemente. So I drive the two hours every once in a while and go meet her at a park and we, we train there. Um, it's almost been a little bit of blessing because now she's shown up here for this fall training and she is just blowing all of her testing numbers out of the water. Like she looks even better than she did last year. So that's, that's awesome. Um, so obviously she's hopefully on track to, to potentially score that 6420 and make the team as well. Um, and then Riley Cooks, uh, we added, I added her last year. Um, she was a new addition. So I didn't have a lot of time that I worked with before COVID hit. Um, but I'm almost, it, it's almost again, one of those things where COVID has been a blessing for her because it gave her a little bit more time to get used to my system. And, and same thing, this last testing block, she just killed it and it was awesome. So speed numbers are up, power numbers are up. Um, we figured some things out in the high jump and, and in the throws. Um, so it's, it's, it's looking really good for her. I think obviously it's gonna be a battle on the day cause <laughs> it's only three they get to go. Um, and there's, there's quite a few uh, good heptathletes out there. Um, Harrison Williams, a uh, new decathlete added to my group. It's always kind of cool when I get to work with a Stanford alum. <laughs> so um, just because you got more stories to talk about since we've both been in the same place. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's been going really, that's been a lot of fun. Um, we kind of made a connection pretty quick and he's bought into a lot of stuff and we've seen a lot of improvements already um, in the throws, uh, which were kind of one of his weak spots. We worked a lot on that posture and balance in the disc and he's really starting to get a grasp of that. And um, even in the javelin, just, I, you know, he's so long. I mean, he's, he's like six, six maybe in height and he's got a, like almost a seven foot wingspan. And so I was like, dude, how are you only throwing the javelin <laughs> 50 meters? <laughs> So, um, but we're just working on, again, it's, it's learning balance and posture and a sequencing and timing of events for him. Um, but I think, I think and, and for him, it's about getting his average up. So like, if you put all of his decathlon PBs together, he can score over 8,600, but his personal best is only 8,160 or something like that. And so I'm like, dude, there is so much room for improvement and we don't even have to PR <laughs> in any, you know, you just have to compete at a higher average like we talked about. So that's, that's really cool um, with Harrison. So I'm looking forward to how that develops. Um, and then um, I work with Beatrice Hatz, who is a um, baloney amputee uh, jumper. And, um, and she's just young. Um, I, we went to the Para Worlds uh, in 2019. And, I mean, she was only 18 years old, so she's got a lot of upside. Uh, and then I also work with a uh, above knee amputee high jumper, long jumper, uh, who's only 15 year old um, up in Orange County or no, UCLA area. And um, so and Ezra is pretty amazing. Um, he's a pretty amazing young man for that, that age <laughs> to, to be competing the way he is. But COVID has been hard. We live in California. Um, people don't seem to know how to follow rules here. So our ICUs are full. Um, we have had cases on, on site. Um, it has shut down our, our weight room, but luckily me and Jamie built outdoor platforms and bought rogue things, you know, so we could still lift outside. Um, obviously we're blessed with San Diego weather, so we can still do that for the most part. I mean, I, I tell you on a cold day, it's like, you know, 50 degrees and that's cold for us. <laughs> well, that would be short wearing weather right now for you. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're, we're on the path of trying to figure out, they, they just basically canceled world indoors. So we're not getting ready for that anymore. Um, but we're probably still gonna get ready for a USA indoors if they still decide to host that. 
um, just because I, I want to use that basically as they're testing at the end of the next training block. Um, I think that'll be a good test to kind of see like, okay, we focus so much on um, basic characteristics of speed and power and stuff. Now let's see if the technical stuff that we started working on sticks in competition. And that's what I like to use competitions for is, you know, are the new cues working? Um, is what we've been working on. Do you revert back to your old way or do you have the new program kind of settled in and you're starting to not have to think about it as much? Um, so that's kind of that's kind of what I use the especially the indoor season for. Outdoors will be interesting because uh, I, you know, will there be meets for us to go to? Are the, are the colleges going to have meets? Um, currently, is it worth it to go? Because if we go, when we get back, we have to quarantine for a week, you know, before we can go, you know, so there is going to, there's no, there's really no more like back-to-back -back weekends of track. <laughs> it's kind of like, well, I'm going to go compete, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to quarantine and then I need to train. So really it's like every two to three weeks, maybe that I'm going to compete. Uh, which is actually okay as long as you pick the right competitions. Um, currently, we're, we're set up to go to Italy at the end of April for our first multi. Gotsis is at the end of May. Uh, I won't take Harrison to that just because it's only two weeks out from the Olympic trials. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's too close for Deck uh, to do it. So he'll probably just do um, Italy, um, maybe another one in the States if I can find it. And yeah, then the Olympic trials and that's obviously our first main focus. Uh, we gotta place top three and hopefully have the standard. If not, by going to those meets in, in Italy and, and uh, Austria, it sets up our world ranking points so that hopefully maybe if we don't hit the standard, we're still ranked high enough that we get selected off the list uh, and, and go to the meet. So you gotta kind of play two games at this level. You got to play the standard game and you got to play the world ranking game. And so you got to kind of figure out different ways to, um, to get people to meet. Um, but yeah, I think, cool. I think, I think COVID is, has done both good things and bad things. Um, it's taught you to be creative. It's taught you that it can happen to anyone, even if you're good at wearing your mask and you socially distance sometimes you get unlucky and you just maybe you touch the surface and you wiped your nose the wrong way or you know it's like it's it's hard to tell it's uh but my hope is that people will continue to just follow some rules wear a mask get vac vaccinated when you get the opportunity to and and uh we can get back to track and field the way that we that we know can't wait for that. <laughs> cool. I, I appreciate you being, you know, so generous with your time. You know, this has been awesome. Um, I know, you know, that we have some some loyal viewers that are really going to enjoy it. Maybe we'll stop the recording there. Feel free to hang out for a minute or two if you want. But um, appreciate 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 you coming out and sharing, giving us a kind of a screenshot of what you what you've been doing, and uh, wish you the best of luck in the next coming year. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Big thanks to Coach Mac for joining us today. I hope you all learned something and enjoyed that. I know I did. If you are looking for more of these um, and more content on the throws, check out our YouTube page, Virtual Throws Conference. Uh, we have 18 more of these and we'll keep posting them. Also, if you're looking for updates on when they drop, BC Groover on Instagram, I'll post updates or National Throws on Instagram or Twitter. That's where we're putting this stuff up. Hey, we will see you next time. Thanks for listening.